Um, hello again. So I thought I was friends with Christian, but for some reason he put me always at, at the end of the day and I flew in from Europe on, on uh, Tuesday, was it? So, so if I fall asleep, um, it's not your fault. Um, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit um, on, on the background of, of quantum mechanics and, and quantum chemistry. But um, then I was told actually uh, this should also include some machine learning. And so um, I, I did that, but um, as a result, um, uh, I'm going to skip point three, important quantum properties and software. And uh, it's like two talks which are sort of disjoint a little bit, but I hope it's okay. So, um, of course, please interrupt me if, if um, there's some open questions. So, um, uh, maybe you might wonder why do we really have to do this quantum stuff and couldn't we uh, just skip it? Um, and uh, so yesterday I, I uh, talked about chemical space and how, how we really need it. So if you query people uh, or, or Google uh, what's the molecule, uh, so, so the ideas vary a lot uh, depending on whom you ask. So uh, this says the molecule is the smallest particle in a chemical element or compound that has the chemical properties of that element or compound. Molecules are made up of atoms that are held together by chemical bonds. These bonds form as a result of the sharing or exchange of electrons among atoms. So um, <clears throat> this is language is very forgiving, right? So um, a bond, for instance, is, is not properly defined in quantum mechanics. There's no operator. There's no expectation value of a bond, right? Yet people talk about bonds. If you if you ask a chemist that as a chemical bond exists, he will question your sanity. Um, so then your average chemist might draw something like this uh, when you ask him what is terpenoid artisan um, and um, that's, that's a molecule. Uh, now um, something a little bit more sophisticated would reflect the 3D structure of, of the coordinates. Um, and then the, the quantum view is, of course, that the whole thing is run by electrons, so we shouldn't forget about them. And they often, of course, the electrons are not these sticks, right? It's, it's not an electron. Um, you can measure uh, molecules and atoms. We can see them nowadays. Right? So, so when I was an undergraduate student, um, the, the AFM techniques were developing so fast that um, you could actually observe um, uh, reactions on surfaces happening and there was a Nobel Prize going to IBM Zurich for this um, uh, and others um, it, w it was shared but but these AFM uh, experiments are extremely powerful and, and just recently there was a synthesis done uh, with, with AFM and it was published in Science um, so you, you can you can see these atoms and these molecules right so I would argue really that these kind of ideas, uh, it's maybe time to, to retire this. Um, all right, but then there are other reasons why we want quantum. If you want to deal with chemical reactions, break, create bonds, uh, you have to go over barriers, you, you cannot assume fixed connectivities. Um, if uh, the atoms change their coordination, just consider sulfur, it can have a, huge range of oxidation states with many different valencies depending on the environment. Um, you can uh, change the regime, so, so phase diagrams are really a huge challenge and, and oftentimes uh, people just focus on, on one point in, in the phase diagram, on one pressure-temperature combination, but in principle of course we'd, we'd like to be able to predict the aggregation state given any pressure or temperature. Right? Um, then uh, a lot of what you commonly hear about is really very selective. The chemical space I was talking about yesterday, is, it lives just with these couple of elements. 
But as soon as you go to, to the, the D and the F elements, um, things get really hairy. And um, there, there's really no alternative to quantum mechanics. Um, <clears throat> then there are, of course, uh, quantum properties. So uh, discrete uh, property changes, uh, like in spectroscopy, you uh, have tunneling effects, uh, the band structure of, of, of uh, solids, these are all quantum properties which are hugely important. And then in some sense, uh, so conceptually, this is the proper thing to do. Right? Uh, so chemistry results from the physics of electrons, and electrons are fermions, so, so uh, that's what you should be using. I mean, uh, quantum mechanics was developed for that. All right, um, so uh, here's Erwin and um, his equation. Uh, and um, now I'd, I'd like to tell you about a very important approximation. Uh, of course, your, your, your uh, Schrodinger equation is applicable to everything. So in principle, it's, you can have the wave function of, of this planet. And we are all part of it. So we share the same wave function, right? We, I, I could argue like that, especially in a math institute. It's, it's OK. And, and physics. Uh, People might look at you in chemistry, they yeah, kick you out. Um, if Janis would be here, your time would be out. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Um, anyhow, so uh, such a wave function is, of course, uh, complete craziness. And so we must uh, do some things. And, and one uh, famous approximation is this uh, product ansatz here. And what you really do is that you say my wave function, which includes nuclei um, and electrons, so all, all uh, elementary particles in your system, is a product of an electronic wave function and a nuclear wave function. And this um, electronic wave function I can uh, consider um, in the environment of clamped nuclei or fixed nuclei. Um, and so um, if you take, for instance, benzene, there are 12 nuclei and 42 electrons, uh, so 54 particles. And just assuming spatial dimensions only, you have 162 dimensions. And so, so this uh, improves if, if you don't have to consider them all. Now, this is a slide from my, my lecture in the fall semester. I, I usually teach uh, uh, sort of quantum chemistry 101 to undergraduate students in Basel, and so um, it's in German. But um, um, so I escaped here, so I don't have to give this lecture. But, but now I, I, I show you one slide. But the important thing are the equations, right? Um, so, so here's your ansatz up there, um, and the, the, um, then your Schrodinger equation becomes this thing, um, and you solve this for every position of the coordinates, right? And, and then you get all properties for this configuration of atoms, and then you can move the atoms, of course, or you can change their nuclear charge, and, and then you have to redo it again. And actually, so Francois Gigi was here. He's one of the uh, key developers of a code that does this um, in a, a running molecular dynamics. And we call this uh, an up initial approach or on the fly calculation of the electronic structure. Every time you change your coordinate, you have to do it. Um, you have to solve the problem again. And there, were, there was, uh, in the 80s, uh, a great idea from Karin Parinello to um, actually propagate the electrons together with the nuclei. So you don't have to start really from scratch, but you, you would have uh, uh, something more reasonable. And so um, this, is, this is a little bit um, uh, the, the idea, just to, to tell you about the context. Um, and so then you, you have a Hamiltonian for your electronic system. And that's uh, the usual um, thing. So you have a kinetic operator, um, the external potential from your clamped nuclei, and the electron-electron interactions. 
And um, <clears throat> we, we know all of these, right? So this is very important. We, we have the variables. So Steve mentioned this earlier today, um, that sometimes in the, the dynamical uh, problems, you, you, don't, uh, you don't know if you have the all variables that, that um, define your state. Um, we, we do have them, and um, they, are, they are quite simple, actually, in the, in the operators. Just uh, uh, you, you only have two electrons in the operator. Right? Um, so um, as a result, then, if you solve this, this Schrodinger equation, right, you get this electronic energy. And then, of course, you have to add the repulsion from the nuclei. And that's your potential energy of your system for, for a given um, configuration. And now, if you change the configuration, you can uh, map out what's called uh, the potential energy surface. Um, and that's a high dimensional surface in, in the number of atoms you have. Right? Um, and it could look like something like this. So here you have a minimum. And, this could be a, a different conform air, and, and this could be a reaction, and you have uh, saddle points, and you can search for the saddle points, you can search for the minima. These are typical um, quantum chemistry tasks. Um, now, if you, if you take the Boltzmann average of the available configurations, and you add the kinetic energy of the nuclei, then you obtain the internal energy of, of, of a given microstate. And, and so um, that, that uh, uh, goes then, connects to uh, the statistical mechanics of the problem, right? And, uh, once you, you include all of that, you, you arrive at observers which uh, have a macroscopic, um, realistic experimental correspondence. Now, um, <clears throat> this is what, what you will uh, find uh, a lot, and also many um, uh, scientists not working on quantum mechanics but just with force fields um, use these pictures. But the quantum world is, is slightly more complicated. So, um, for instance, your, your protons, they are very light and they could tunnel and effectively um, allow, it's as if the barrier would be lowered but you, then you're lowering the solution of your electronic Schrodinger equation. Right? And um, this, this is an effect which is quite important. Um, it's uh, often measured in terms of what we call the kinetic isotope effect. Right? It's an experimental observable, and for hydrogen atoms it can be quite substantial. Right? You can even use it to elucidate reaction mechanisms. Um, so that's something that comes on top of that. But um, maybe even more importantly, this is just the electronic ground state. The Schrodinger equation gives you many solutions, an entire spectrum. Right? And so for any configuration, you should always consider that there are many higher lying electronic states that are also possible. Right? And if, for instance, you provide an energy by light or through other means, um, the, the system, if, if you provide that exact quantum of energy that matches this gap, the system can be excited. And then you live on a completely different surface. And all your chemical intuition really goes out of the window. Because the, the, what you would usually expect in terms of angles or bond distances uh, is no longer correct. Our intuition is built on the ground state uh, of the surface. Um, um, so these are um, very abundant processes. It's not as if this was exotic. For instance, we all can see because of something like this. Uh, in your eye, there's a molecule, a retinal uh, compound, which is a cis-trans isomer. And due to light excitation, you change the configuration. You change from one isomer to the other. And that triggers an, an entire cascade of proteins in your eye. And that, that processes the signal that your brain should now perceive some color. Um, so this is really not exotic. And, and then tons of other examples. Right? All right. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is just uh, to give you a little bit of context and an idea. Now, um, why, why is this um, 
This is, so it's a differential equation, and why is it so so difficult, really? I mean, we heard it this morning about differential equations, so I mean, maybe we could just solve it. And so what's so tough? Um, well, in principle, it depends on all the coordinates, so it's a high dimension. That was one of the seven challenges this morning, right? So it's high dimensional. Um, but then it also has to obey this uh, freaky Pauli exclusion principle. And that's really something very beautiful. It results from the fact that electrons are fermions. Um, so this is a very fundamental property. And um, this exclusion principle results in, um, in something that you can view as an anti-symmetry condition which is when you exchange two electrons in your wave function, your wave function should change sign. Right? So this is uh, something which is as true as uh, the conservation law we, we just heard about uh, in the previous lecture. Um, you should also um, be able to minimize uh, the energy, which is the expectation value of that wave function with the Hamilton operator. And that minimization should uh, give you the ground state wave function. So, uh, and it, it also is subject to constraint on, on normalization uh, uh, to, to, define, uh, to define this uh, Hilbert space in which it lives. So, so this is, uh, these are quite terrible constraints. Um, now, um, one uh, Example why this is so terrible, just imagine storing it. So uh, I gave you the example of water. Yesterday, water has 10 electrons. Imagine two water molecules. You'd have 20 electrons, which you can distribute over 10 orbitals, right? Um, and then you, you say, well, in x, y, and z, I take 10 points, so very coarse grid, right? Uh, and then on each point, you, you store some information of four bytes. Now, if you do this, then you, you have a 1,000 to the 10 points, or the 10 orbitals. And that's 1 million yotta bytes. I think yotta is the largest prefix. It's 10 to the 24. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's the problem, right? And, and so we have approximations. And, and quantum chemistry has many, and these are famous names and um, uh, uh, cherished uh, in the community. So Hartree, Fock, and Slater, Hücke, uh, the couple cluster series. Um, these are, we, we build on, uh, on uh, the, the Hartree, Fock, uh, so um, Hartree-Fock stands out because um, it represents um, a wave function approximation which obeys the anti-symmetry condition. Right? So the, the ansatz is a uh, determinant, a Slater determinant. You write a determinant of your um, uh, uh, single electron orbitals. And, and these determinants have the property when you change um, uh, the indices, they, they change the sign. Um, but that's the only, at that level, there's no more correlation, right? So you can view this anti-symmetry condition as a correlation effect, um, but um, you don't have a correlation operator or anything in, in this, right? Um, but there's much more electron correlation. So it's a mean field approach which obeys uh, anti-symmetry. But um, then uh, this is sort of a, a cornerstone in quantum chemistry, and, and then you have perturbation theory, and all these methods, we call them the, the post hartree fock methods. So, so they are supposed to be much more accurate. Uh, I should uh, mention John Popel, who shared the Nobel Prize with, with Walter Kohn in 98 for what's called the model chemistry, and I'll come back later to that. Uh, we, we have some, uh, we revisited this with machine learning. Now, and in theoretical physics, the same sort of happened, um, only all the names are different. But you can see that uh, there's a, a lot of the things have been invented multiple times. Um, uh, you, you can think of uh, uh, the cohn the sham DFT as being very similar to Hartree-Fock, actually. It's, it's, uh, it's also mean field and... Um, 
Anyhow, so um, the, these are uh, semi-empirical methods also, so there's some electrons present, and, and then you, you have the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the many-body uh, theories, and you have quantum Monte Carlo, and uh, these are uh, famous uh, uh, scientists working in the field, like David Seppali or John Perdue. All right, so um, the idea then is that um, as, as you work your way up, <laughs> Through these hierarchies, through the through this hierarchy, you will approach this this holy grail. But of course, there is no free lunch, and so you have to pay with uh, for our our ignorance and uh, uh, inability to uh, solve quantum chemistry in our head. We have to pay with with CPU time, and and time is money, of course, right? So um, so usually. Uh, uh, you, depending on, on uh, where you live and so on, um, you have to pay like 10 to 1 cent or so per CPU hour. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in 98 there was a Nobel Prize for, for these uh, quantum chemistry methods, Walter Cohn and, and um, John Popel. So I'd, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about density functional theory because it really stands out in in terms of being uh, extremely useful to the extent that uh, many experimentalists use it, um, uh, even without theoreticians. Um, so um, it rests on uh, this question if, so in the postulates of quantum mechanics, the, the first postulate says uh, your system is the wave function. And so one of, of the big uh, questions, open questions, was can you use the electron density instead of the wave function? So, so the one particle electron density, you obtain it by averaging out all other electrons. So you reduce your, your free n, or depending if you also include spin, um, 4n dimensional function into a, a free d function. Right? So that, that, that will be fantastic, right? Uh, so that's the promise. And, and um, Walter Kohn uh, uh, contributed the hohenberg kohn theorems, and then also the kohn sham equation. And, um, the first hohenberg kohn theorem um, proves that you can uh, do this. You can use the density instead. And, and the second is uh, on, on the variation, uh, that there's a variational principle also for the electron density. Now, um, the, the proof is, is super easy. So I thought we, for those who don't know it, it's, it's really very important in our community. And um, it's, it's very easy. So it, it goes through um, reductio ad absurdum. So you assume the, the opposite of what you want to show. And then you um, look at the consequences of assuming that. And then uh, you, you will find that the consequences conflict uh, each other. And so they cannot be true. And so the opposite has to be true. Um, so let's assume the opposite of what we want to show. So let's assume we have two different potentials. So let's say two different molecules. Imagine water and ammonia, uh, V1 and V2. And they, of course, have their wave functions, right? Psi 1 and Psi 2. And so now you say, I'm going to use the wave function of system 2 with the potential of system 1. And that expectation value, because of the variation of principle, must be larger than the expectation value of the wave function 1 with the potential of 1. And so you have this inequality. Now, the assumption is that these two wave functions give you the same density. So this means that the wave function of system 2 and the wave function of system 1 should give you, in both cases, this same integral for your wave function, for your electron density. Okay. So um, if you take that part from the expectation value, then you have for these two parts the same, so they cancel. And so this inequality beca would become this one. Right? So um, this is the electron-electron kinetic operator and the electron-electron interaction. So ammonia and water, for instance, have the same number of electrons. Right? So, so you can actually imagine this uh, immediately for these two systems. 
Um, and the geometry I told you yesterday sits in this external potential, so now that went away. So we don't have a geometry, we don't have an external potential anymore. It's just the electrons wobbling around, okay? Um, now, we do exactly the same, but with the, we exchange the indices. So we have the external potential 2 here and the wave function of 1. And that, of course, is also larger than external potential 2 and wave function 2. Um, and so it will cancel again, and you arrive at this inequality. And now if you compare these two inequalities, they, they, they are just flipped, right? So uh, you can just add them up, and then you see A and B is larger than A and B. Okay. And that's absur absurd, and that's it. But shouldn't that be a great equal instead of no, if you put the wave function of water into ammonia, it's going to be greater, not equal. Yeah, probably, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, so, no, 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 no. So, um, if, if there's a difference, if there's a difference between the wave functions, the, the expectation value of, of the, the other uh, wave function with your uh, original potential is going to be larger. I mean, they are different, right? Psi 1 and Psi 2 have to be different. Yeah. No, in the limit that they approach each other, then uh, everything becomes equal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, and now about the cohn sharm ansatz, uh, the problem with um, uh, using just the electron density was that um, we know in the Schrodinger equation um, the uh, operators for each electron, that's okay, but we don't know the operator for the electron density. In particular, the, the biggest problem is there's no operator for the kinetic energy working on your electron density. And so that's a huge problem in what we call orbital-free density functional theory. There, there are uh, very good people working on this, and uh, there are also approximations, and for some systems they, they work quite well. But um, what, what then uh, Kohn and Sham did was to say, well, let's go back to our Hartree-Fock idea which is we write a determinant of single electron. So this is a determinant of single electron orbitals. And for each of those, we write a Schrodinger equation, which contains our kinetic term for that electron. And then we have a potential, which we call the cohn sharm potential. I mentioned that yesterday. We meet all the constraints on, on orbitals, which we like. And then when we sum up the square of the orbitals, we recover our electron density. And so we start playing uh, with both. We, we use both. When we need orbitals, we use orbitals. When we need density, we use density. And that um, gives you uh, very um, high accuracy, um, better so than, um, than Hartree-Fock. And you can write your energy then in the cohn sharm picture as your, your, this is the contribution from your external potential. You have the kinetic part from the orbitals. You have the repulsion, the classical repulsion of the electrons. And then you have a term which is dubbed the exchange correlation um, energy. And uh, it's defined down here. And if you look at this, this is the true kinetic energy. We subtract the cohn sharm uh, kinetic energy. This is the true interaction energy, and we subtract the classical Hartree energy. So everything quantum, which we do not know, is defined to be the exchange correlation potential. In other words, we put all the dirt under the carpet. Uh, so the trick is then to approximate this exchange correlation potential. And um, there, there, this is what the different density functionals 
mean, right? If you look in the literature, people, or people ask you which functional did you use, you're talking about which approximation did you use to this exchange correlation potential. And so it's uh, akin to uh, talking about asking which force field did you, did you use, so, or which uh, machine learning regressor did you use. So. Um, so um, John Perdue established this idea that we can also have a hierarchy of approximations in the space of exchange correlation potentials. And he called this uh, Jacob's Ladder. Um, so there's a, a painting, um, uh, and, and this is uh, also Jacob's Ladder. I mean, from the Bible, Jacob uh, dreams and sees the angles climb uh, the ladder to uh, the, the skies. And this is from uh, the, uh, the church in Bath in, in the UK. Um, <clears throat> so what, what do these rungs uh, mean? The, the local density assumes that your electrons behave uh, like in the uniform electron gas. So a sea of electrons. And um, this sea is being perturbed by the nuclei then, uh, which you drop into the whole thing. Um, you can um, include information of gradients of the density as well. And that's what we call the GGAs. Um, then uh, meta GGAs include um, second order derivatives in the electron density. Um, the hybrid functionals include uh, uh, explicitly orbitals in the energy expression. So, let me. Here you see we, we don't have an explicit orbital dependence in, in the exchange correlation uh, energy. It just depends on the electron density. It's only in the, through the kinetic energy that you have orbitals coming in, right? But they are summed up, right, also averaged. So it's, it's truly density functional expression, right? Um, you, you're just relying on, on under the hood there are these orbitals. Now if you make the exchange correlation um, uh, potential explicitly dependent on the orbitals, then you can use um, uh, what's called exact exchange. So this is an exchange uh, contribution to the energy which is uh, uh, similar or often just scaled um, from uh, as you would see it in Hartree-Fock. And then you can also include non-occupied orbitals, and, and that's the, the fifth rung, and that's uh, like having excitations. And in the post hartree fock methods, there's, that's typically how you go beyond. Uh, you include um, interactions between empty and filled orbitals, and uh, they contribute to the energy. Now, um, <coughs> If you just look at the common functionals, LDA, GGA, meta hybrid, for uh, these various um, um, properties here, structures, energies, barriers, band gap, intermolecular electron transfer, you see that um, roughly speaking, as you go from left to right, things improve. So these are ballpark sort of experience experiences. Um, here are some more specific numbers from uh, a paper um, it's already more than 10 years old from, uh, uh, by Ann Madsen um, on uh, a GGA, LDA. These are also GGAs. These are hybrids. Uh, these are lattice constants and, and solids, a whole bunch of solids. Uh, 20 solids, and this is the bulk moduli, so, so the, the elasticity of, of the material, if you wish. And these are the arrows, how they perform. And, and so these hybrid functions are, are uh, considered to be extremely accurate. Now, um, in this paper, um, the, the point was that the AMO5 functional, um, uh, which Ann Madsen also developed, uh, is actually a GGA kind of functional, and it's, it's similar to in performance to hybrids. So this hierarchy is, is not very strict, in other words. Right? Now, um, once you solved your quantum um, problem, uh, you can get many properties. And uh, typically, uh, you, you, all you have to do is you take your, your wave function, and you have some observable, and you calculate it as the expectation value of the corresponding operator. Right? And if there's no operator, then you don't have an observable. 
So, so there's no operator for the chemical bond. If, if you find one, you, you get the Nobel Prize in chemistry, I guess. Um, so uh, this is an example of an important property. The, the forces uh, on some atom, I, and um, this is the expectation. So this is the derivative, of course. And this is um, then uh, the expectation value of a perturbing um, uh, a perturbation operator. The response operator is the operator for uh, this observable. And um, this is the proof uh, how you get through differentiation um, of the energy expectation value to the force expectation value. This is the Hellman Feynman theorem. It was shown by multiple people already before uh, Feynman, and um, Hellman was among the first. Um, uh, the proof is very simple. If you go through this, you, you collect these three terms in, in the differentiation, and then you see that you have here um, twice uh, the derivatives of um, the, the inner product of the wave function, um, one's left, one's right-handed, and you pulled out the energy due to the Hamiltonian operator being Hermitian. Right. And uh, so, so the, uh, the, uh, the Hamilton operator being Hermitian is, is one of the crucial um, uh, postulates in, in quantum mechanics. Um, it rests on the idea that your, your, what you can measure, your measurable observers, uh, have to be real numbers. Uh, and then this operator has to be Hermitian. And because of that, you, you can operate to the left and the right. And this, these two guys are then the same as, as this derivative. And now you're deriving the inner product of, of the wave function, which is a constant. So it's 0, and you're left with this. Now, uh, this is the explicit expression then. So you have the integral over density. So once you have your density, once you have your wave function, you just plug it into this formula. You get the forces on all your three n components uh, in your system, right? So it, it comes for free. Um, now, uh, we expand these densities and orbitals in basis sets. And um, so for some orbital eigenvalue i, um, we, we typically have a basis here. And in, in a linear combination, um, uh, series expansion. And the question of, of uh, if, is your basis set converged is a classic trap for, for beginners in the field. So um, this is very important. Um, and there are different ideas how to do this. Um, one is to put a basis function on every atom. Uh, so you have an angular component, typically, and a radial component. Um, and this is uh, motivated uh, with this idea that um, uh, that's where the electrons should sit, so it corresponds to chemical intuition. Um, so you often get um, also pretty decent results already for small basis functions. Um, the problem is, um, by, uh, if you just do it naively, they are not orthogonal. Um, they will depend on, on nuclear positions. And you can also have uh, artifacts from basis set superposition, so basically sort of double counting um, for certain uh, geometries. And then also depending on the element, depending on the environment of the atom, you might need different, you will encounter different convergence uh, behavior uh, for these basis set functions. So it's, it's not very obvious how, how to converge these. Um, another alternative uh, uh, is a plane wave basis. So um, this is more similar to the uniform electron gas. So assume molecules are assemblies of, of atoms that distort the free electrons. And so you, you can have this uh, plane wave expansion here. And um, you can exploit then, of course, uh, Fourier transforms. And uh, some of these integrals, which you need to calculate in quantum mechanics, are much uh, cheaper than in Fourier space. And so you, you can uh, uh, choose from, from uh, because the, the Fourier transforms are extremely efficient um, uh, with, with your uh, typical um, libraries. Um, you can choose uh, in which space you want to integrate. 
Um, so um, they are independent of nuclear positions also. Um, and it's very nice because they only have a single convergence cut off. The big drawback is that you usually need many, many functions, right? So um, again, no free lunch. Let me skip this. Then there's also um, uh, something uh, called the pseudopotential. Um, in, in particular, when you use uh, plane waves, um, you need a lot of plane waves to describe the core electrons, which uh, change uh, very rapidly. Um, so um, there was this old idea already by Hans Hellmann in, in the beginning of, of last century um, to actually um, uh, take away the core electrons. And uh, so because core electrons typically are not involved in the chemistry you're, you're interested in, um, so um, you could uh, just assume they are frozen and then model them by an effective potential, right? So the valence electrons feel the presence by the core electrons through a potential which is fixed rather than through the actual electrons. And this works uh, very well. Um, it reduces the, base, uh, the necessary basis set size. It reduces your number of electrons, so that's also nice. And you can also include uh, other effects in, in terms of a correction here. For instance, relativistic effects um, for heavy atoms, that's very important. You can include also corrections to your electronic structure. Um, inclusion of uh, van der Waals effects and pseudopotentials was what I, I did during my PhD. Um, and as recently as this year, um, somebody uh, looked, of, uh, looked at uh, using pseudopotentials to, um, uh, to improve the description of pi orbital electrons. Right? So this is active. It's, it's not a huge field, but um, uh, it's, it's uh, happening. And here you see how it works. So you, you have a cutoff. This is the position of your nucleus. Uh, this is the region of your valence electrons. Here you want to be uh, as uh, si similar as possible to the full electron picture. And then you replace in the, in the interior part, in your core, you replace the, the actual potential by some effective potential and the actual electron density or, or electron, uh, the orbitals, by some effective uh, electron density. And at your nucleus, actually, um, there's uh, uh, hardly any electrons when you use pseudopotentials, right? Um, but um, because all the chemistry happens out here, you, you don't care. So now, um, other questions uh, on, on this? It was uh, very general, very introductory, but I hope it, it sort of gave you an idea of, of uh, the, the world um, I'm, I'm coming from. Now, I'd, I'd like to um, switch gears now and, and go to the machine learning. And uh, this actually connects exactly. So, so Frank showed this figure this morning, right? So your error versus model complexity. Um, and um, everything he said was true, except for one thing. So he, he said, as you, as you increase the training set size, this minimum shifts to the right, because you can, uh, you can afford building more complex models. And, and that's, of course, true. But it, he forgot to mention that it, it should also shift down, right and down. Right? It should improve. And, and um, that, that is um, what, what uh, I was uh, also mentioning, telling you yesterday about, right? As, as you grow your training um, set size, your, your prediction error here, after you, you found this optimal, this optimum, that error will come down. So you, so you have this, this additional dimension here, right, of training set size. Um, I didn't show that. <coughs> I didn't show that. <laughs> I think you were sleeping. <laughs> it was just okay, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm terribly jet lagged. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what we are all um, scared about, of course, is, is th this sort of regime. You, you have some data and, and you uh, chose a uh, too rigid model, right? That's, that's really silly. Um, and this is, of course, foolish, so um, uh, this looks crazy. But actually, um, if you just, strictly speaking, this is, this is uh, no worse than this, right? 
It's just that you're assuming mentally, of course, that this function behaves in uh, rather than uh, like the blue line here. Then, but it could be that you add new data points and it will actually not be overfitting, but right on. So, so it's it's. Um, to me, often I, I find the arguments that are being presented, they, they, they are intuitive, but it's, it's not always uh, uh, very rigorous. So let me recast um, these things. And I'll be talking about, I will not bore you with cross-validation and how we get to this minimum and so on. Let's just assume we are always here. We, we, we don't overfit. Yeah? Um, what happens then? Um, we have data where the numerical noise of our solutions is orders of magnitude smaller than the signal which we observe in experiments. Right? So the chemical accuracy I mentioned yesterday is like 1k cal per mole. The errors typically, um, if you did a decent quantum chemistry calculation, should be at most 10% of that. Right? So. Um, of course, you, you can uh, run a poor quantum chemistry calculation, and then the error will be 1k cal per mole, or even, even larger. And, and that has happened in the past also. But um, uh, if you do things properly, your, your noise level in, in the data should be um, much, much smaller than the, the variation as, as you go through the instances. And so the picture then on, uh, that emerges is that we don't really want to compromise like shown in the red here. Right? We, don't, we don't want to miss any of these data points. Right? So here in this just right fit, right? You're, you're negotiating here uh, data points. You're saying some are more worthwhile than other, others. Um, and, and we don't want that. So we really want to rather interpolate here. And, and uh, what happens then to your test and training curves, right, if you do this? It, it looks like this. So in, in the traditional sort of sense, right, in this sense here, um, you, you both of these come together, right? And, and once you went here, um, this is the actual performance. I, I believe you called it bias, right? Um, uh, but in, in when, when we have very small noise, uh, which we can really control, and, and the kernel rich regressions through the regularizer, we, we can make these uh, numbers very, very small. Um, then you rather encounter the, the blue scenario, right? So your training error is very, very small. And it stays this small, and your test error comes down uh, to that level at some point. So now you assume the blue curve is under the red curve. <coughs> so this one or this one? The dashed curve, then your solid curve also goes down, and this is not generally true. What is not generally if... So now you, you reduced the bias. From red to blue, you basically review, reduced or removed the bias. Yes, yes, you, you... And you assume your variance also reduces. You, you assume uh, no, reduce yeah, the no, that's assumed here. It, it could start somewhere here, right? Yeah. But at some point, you will have a crossover. And it could be out here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Parametric versus non-parametric model. Yes. Yes. Exactly. 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 So, so fixed parameters. Yes, that's exactly. Now, um, to us, uh, to me, I mean, I, I was uh, completely ignorant, of course, uh, in my youth, and so um, when I learned about this and how we can use this, um, it was an epiphany, right? So, so uh, wonderful. Um, so this means um, that um, using something as simple as this, so just some uh, uh, yeah, close to trivial uh, linear expansion here, I can um, get now, with given some training data, I can get the most likely answer for whatever happens in between. Right? And then, as you would expect, as you increase the training data density, that error should come down. And, and so that's what Vapnik also proved, that it comes down. And um, so this is the idea. We plug in some, some molecule, and we, we use uh, what we input to the Schrodinger equation 
to infer the solution uh, of, the, uh, of the Schrodinger equation for new interpolating regimes. So if this is chemical space, then we go somewhere in chemical space, new compound, and we infer the solution. And we know as we increase the training set size, that prediction should become increasingly more accurate. Now, um, yeah, as, as Patrick just mentioned, um, one way is to do kernel rich regression. That would be non parametric. So, number of coefficients or degrees of freedom or complexity grows with training. Um, or in, a, in the standard neural net, um, your, your number of coefficients is fixed. Huh? Now, if, if you choose it big enough, of course, you, you can uh, get a very accurate fit. So, in other words, you reduce that bias. Right? Um, so, um, we, we started out um, with these uh, three trustworthy gentlemen in, in 2011. And um, it was actually in, in this building where um, uh, Klaus promised me that this should be possible. And of course, he wanted to know what, how do we, what, what is a molecule, right? How, how do you represent a compound? Um, and um, so I, I um, uh, proposed this matrix, and this idea is basically that you say a molecule really is, is a bunch of atoms, of course. And imagine you, you have something like the benzene molecule with, with uh, your six carbon atoms, and then their hydrogens, right? The idea is then, well, I, I can record this compound by um, giving a list of interactions of these atoms, right? So I go to one atom, and I say, it will interact with all other atoms, right? And the simplest mode of interaction I could think of was Coulomb's law. So you, you write the Coulomb interaction of hydrogen with atom 1, distance to 1, 2, distance to 2, and so on. And then you go to the next atom and you repeat. Right? And so before you know it, you have the Coulomb matrix. And um, that's what then. Matthias programmed, and uh, Alex pro produced the numbers, the training data for this. And so the picture which you really have then is that this matrix, each for each molecule, this matrix is a point in chemical space. And we measure the distance just by the Euclidean norm between these matrices. You plug them into some simple kernel function. And out comes this, right? And um, to the best of our knowledge, this was the first time that quantum energies uh, were machine learned through chemical space. The error, the prediction error of 10 kK per mole is roughly what a GGA would give you. So we are talking one CPU hour investment for any of these molecules. While, of course, after training, uh, your machine learning execution is milliseconds. <clears throat> now, I mentioned yesterday that Wapnick and others showed that the leading error term should um, decay inversely with training set size. Um, and so this is why we like these log-log scales. And, um, this is really, uh, we can compare then different models based on these uh, linear plots. Um, we also, um, in 2013 then, of course, if you know Klaus, uh, he's also fond of neural nets. Uh, we had to repeat the exercise with Grégoire Montavon for neural nets. This was the first deep neural net through chemical space um, in 2013. Um, and we immediately output um, multiple electronic properties with this neural net, while in this previous uh, work we only had the energies. So this picture I showed yesterday, what uh, the promise is now that we can also use machine learning to get uh, down here. 
and um, after training we, we get a, a, a very interesting execution speed. And so you shifted the, the cost of the whole thing from, from our perspective. Now instead of calculating, doing the quantum calculation on the fly, you have to do it um, upfront, right? But once trained, um, you, you can then uh, use these um, in, of course, only in the space which you've covered. Um, so we have until five, right? Why, why are you yawning? <laughs> it's, it's some exchange effect. Um, so it's, um, this is the QM9 data set I, I told you yesterday about. Um, the original data set we had um, contained only 7,000 molecules and we wanted to converge things better. So uh, we carefully went through uh, typical protocols in quantum chemistry to make sure that uh, things work out. And in these 130,000 molecules there, um, I think roughly a thousand or so where things actually don't work out. Um, these are sort of tricky molecules um, uh, which um, don't fit in the usual way we like to construct basis sets, we like to construct initial uh, coordinates and so on. So it's just to tell you that already for all these molecules are very simple molecules in principle. They were all designed to be e easily accessible for the experimental chemist, yet uh, roughly 1% yeah, of them causes problems uh, for us. So, so there's definitely uh, still a lot of work that's needed. I showed you this example yesterday, as well as the distributions of the various electronic properties. And um, now coming back, to um, these kind of learning curves. If you plot them on a log-log scale, um, you can easily distinguish those learning curves which level off to some bias and those which just decay with one with inverse, inversely with training set size, which by naked um, eye would be difficult, of course, right? Um, but um, if, if you're doing things properly, you should recover linearity. And of course, if, if you only can afford so much data, you, you have a problem, right? Because you actually need so much data to get to the accuracy you desire. Um, so we, we looked at this um, uh, model here, and um, uh, we can uh, notice that um, uh, something that, that was important in the last talk, certain invariances uh, directly are reflected in, in this learning curve. Imagine, for instance, you have some, for example, translational invariances. You don't have it in your model, so you have to inflate your training set size by a factor of three. So you plug in n prime into your um, into your um, error decay, and you see immediately that this invariance increases the offset in your learning curve by a factor of b log of three. Um, there's another remark I'd like to make. Um, if you look at this model, and you think of the Coulomb matrix entering your kernel, the Coulomb matrix doesn't know about your properties. Right? This is just nuclear charges and coordinates. Um, so how would you learn some other property? Um, when you invert your kernel, you, you just use a different reference vector. So the units of your property are being carried by the coefficients. Um, so if you compare that to quantum mechanics, I, I just wrote this down, right? This is how you get your wave function, and then you get your observable by calculating using that wave function um, with the right operator. So in some sense, the kernel doesn't change, the wave function doesn't change for your properties. In other words, the kernel is the analog to your system, right? Um, while uh, your alpha coefficients then take care of the specific property. So we tested this um, by saying, um, let's use some um, Gaussian kernel, uh, well, I think it was a Laplacian, and we use as, as a width a universal 
um, value which ensures, it enforces that the systems that are furthest apart have a kernel entry of one half. Right? If, if you impose that, then you take the largest distance and you divide by log two, and that gives you sigma. And that sigma is independent of property, right? So this kernel then was completely property independent. And then we trained all sorts of properties, and this is what you get. So take any training set size, the kernel which was used for this training set size is always the same, no matter which property we are looking at. Right? Um, so, um, and you see learning, right? the whole thing learns. Now, there's a problem in uh, these kernels and the representations when um, you map um, your molecules onto um, a representation um, which is not unique, meaning two different molecules would give you the same representation. This doesn't happen for the Coulomb matrix, but what we actually used was not the Coulomb matrix, but rather the eigenvalue spectrum of the Coulomb matrix. This was for convenience, because the matrix depends on how you index the atoms, and we, we didn't like that, so we just used the spectrum, and learning curves look great. Um, if you actually used um, a, a sorted uh, sort of Coulomb matrix, the learning curves didn't change much, so, so we didn't bother. But actually, you can have um, different molecules or different geometries map onto the same eigenvalue spectrum. And then you lose uniqueness. You can also use a stripped down version of the Coulomb matrix, which uh, we dubbed Bob. Um, so this is the bag of bonds. And it's basically a vectorized version where you uh, bag all those off diagonal elements which um, have the same uh, pair of elements. Now, this uh, bagged version then never compares different bonds, if you wish. And it only compares the same bonds, uh, just different distances. And with this, we got slightly better learning curves. But also, Bob is, is not unique. And uh, this uniqueness is, is, lack of uniqueness is really a problem. And in this paper, we, we gave a formal proof that uh, actually following the hohenberg cohn uh, proof uh, uh, by analogy, um, you can show that if your representation is not unique, you, will, uh, you can get absurd results. Um, now let me give you an example of a configuration where this shows up. Um, uh, this is a homometric molecule. What's a homometric molecule or homometric uh, geometry? It's a geometry where the list of interatomic distances is identical. And um, uh, just imagine a planar system with four atoms, um, and now a second system, also planar with four atoms. Basically, we took atom two and we moved it on, on the other side here, right? That's the only change we did. Now, if you count the distances, you have the exact same number of distances um, in uh, these two configurations. Um, <coughs> the uh, environment of each atom contains a short, a medium, a short bond. And here, all atoms have a short, medium, and long bond. So it's the environment that changed, right? Um, now, if you apply the Coulomb matrix to these two systems, the Coulomb matrices differ. They, they are unique. But if you apply uh, the bag of bonds to the two, um, they would be identical. Um, incidentally, this is also uh, an illustration of the importance of many body effects. If you use only two body uh, potentials, these two configurations would have the same energy. Um, this is not an exotic example. Here is a second example of two homometric systems. Uh, imagine something like a planar ammonia, where the nitrogen sits in the center versus a tetrahedral ammonia, where the nitrogen is moved outward. And now you arrange the atom bonds such that these short bonds become now the, the bonds in the triangle of, of the free hydrogens. And the long bonds here uh, become the edges on, on the tetrahedral that 
come out of the plane. And then you see again that we have the same list of, of uh, interatomic distances. Now, um, if you use, for instance, the Lena Jones two body van der Waals potential for these two complexes, you obtain this dashed line here for both of them. They are degenerate. No matter what's the scaling, this is a scaling function here which you apply to both uh, configurations, right? Um, these kind of, if, if you invert ammonia, or if you imagine the vibration of ammonia, um, this is a very, uh, these would be very typical uh, uh, geometries, configurations you, you would encounter. Addition of a three body term lifts the spurious degeneracy and you can distinguish the two uh, cases. All right, so um, with this I'd, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit now about an actual application where um, we used machine learning to um, uh, do some science. And um, one, one thing, of course, which also is uh, maybe contributes to a clash of cultures, if you wish, is when you come more from the physics side of things, you, you typically grew up with this sort of idea that uh, you really want to, uh, to stick to Occam's razor, right? And actually, I encountered this first at IPEM as well as many other things. Ralf Trautz, a long-term um, participant in IPEM also, made this statement, simplicity has its value, or simple as possible, but not simple. And Einstein, of course, coined it um, very well. So um, given all of that, um, we now encounter in our current uh, zeitgeist this kind of situation, or maybe even worse. Uh, this is Schnett, and uh, I leave it to you to guess who is the dark force. Um, we, we started out with alpasolites. These are quaternary crystals. Um, they, they exist in nature. Um, actually, they are studied for scintillator properties. And they contain four different elements on a regular uh, highly symmetric unit cell. And so you encode, you can encode, as long as you stick to this alpasolite structure, you can encode uniquely this system by uh, this, this vector where on each row, you, you have the, the group and the period and the periodic table for each of the four elements. Right? And that encodes uniquely your, your crystal. So it, it couldn't be simpler. Um, you plug this into your kernel rich regression, and you can machine learn the formation energy calculated by DFT. If you provide 10,000 examples, you reach 0.1 EV per atom, and that's the accuracy of GGA. Now, um, there is something like 2 million apostolite crystals you can uh, think of if you're allowed to draw from all main group elements in the periodic table. And uh, that's what we um, trained on here. Uh, for 10,000 of them, we, had, we generated DFT uh, numbers, and then we used the model to scan all the two millions. And here you're looking at uh, two million um, energies now. Um, it's a five-dimensional plot. Um, the first component here is uh, one element. This is the second element. And for each combination, you have, again, a block of third and fourth element from the main group. Uh, in the periodic table. And the color is, is the energy. Right? And so uh, we can use then these machine learning predictions to identify interesting compounds. In particular, we propose 90 compounds uh, which were on the convex hull. So uh, they, they were discovered, if you wish. They should be stable if you bother to make them. And they were added to the materials project. This was the first edition of an, uh, a data set of new compounds discovered by machine learning, which were added um, to the materials project. And this is one of them. Uh, the stoichiometry is calcium-6, aluminum-2, nitrogen, and fluoride. Um, and this is really exotic because aluminum in this system happens to have a negative oxidation state. And uh, that's extremely unusual. Right? It's, it's normally a metal. OK, so for the remainder of the time, we, we have until 6 PM, right? No. Okay. So. 
So in Basel, it's 2 a.m. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you now about old stuff, right? So I'll be here for the second workshop, and if you want to hear the new stuff, you, you, you'll have to come again. And, um, but um, I'd like to tell you about how we try to pull down these lear learning curves uh, and, and uh, how, how we manage to do, at least in some cases. So um, this is how things started out. The Coulomb matrix gives you a learning curve like this for the QM9 data, uh, atomization energies. Um, you go to Bob, you get a lower learning curve, right? So you needed 100,000 or so to get close to it. So chemical accuracy is uh, 0 0.05 or so uh, EV. Um, <coughs> when we queried Klaus Müller, what should we do to pull down these learning curves, he said, well, you should add more physics. And um, that's easier said than done. So. Um, uh, one thing that was easy to do, though, is to remove physics. And, and so this is shown here. So if, if this is your 1 over R from a Coulomb potential, um, that's roughly how, how the energy changes with the distance of the atoms. What the energy doesn't do as you increase the distance is to increase, like this red one. Not linearly and certainly not quadratically, like this black one. So if, if adding more physics improves things, then removing physics should make things worse. So this is the learning curve for the Coulomb matrix. You make it grow linearly with the distance. It, it comes up, and quadratically, things get worse. Right? So the, the basic physics of your system, and of course, this is also what Tristan <laughs> showed before, um, affects your model uh, dramatically. Um, of course, we then went the other way around, and things converge for QM9, the atomization energies, with exponents of, of 6, yeah. r to the minus 6, which is uh, uh, similar to London dispersion, right? So uh, the van der Waals or Leonard Jones state. So we thought um, then the, the best model of interactions between atoms is a, is a force field. So let's use the force field in the representation. There's the universal force field, for instance, by Goddard and, and Rappe from the 90s. And there we have nice uh, 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 hierarchies. So we have atom terms, bonds, angles, torsion. Right? And we can include them all in our representation. Every time we include them, we can look what, what happens to the learning curve. And sure enough, this is the learning curve for bonds, just Morse potentials. It's actually worse than just 1 over R. But as soon as you add the angles, you, you get a huge improvement. And then with torsion, you get even more so. Now, this was just for these uh, isomers, the energy. But here you see other properties. And for all these other properties for the isomers, you always observe this trend. Um, and then uh, if you included also the other stoichiometries, all other properties, um, always the same trend. Right? So strong numerical evidence that um, adding more physics does help. Um, we, it, uh, we baptized this model the Bummel model, so the bonds, angles, dihedra, so, so BA, and then machine learning. So that's the Bummel model, um, which is also in German. Uh, what, how would you translate to have Bummel? Uh, <laughs> Bummel, <Yeah. laughs> yeah, something like this. Uh, so then. Um, uh, so uh, that, uh, when you say you, you include torsions, um, if there's no response are not observable, does it mean all triplets of atoms? Or? No, so in the UFF torsion, you have uh, torsional effects between covalently bonded, so dihedrals. But you have to define okay. where the covalent bond is. So yes, 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 yes. No, you, yeah, you can use distance uh, criteria, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite easy. So um, then in uh, 2016 or 17, 
Um, I, I met uh, Patrick Riley, who was, who was here in the audience, and um, we sort of, uh, he, they, they were wondering what, what can uh, neural nets do, what can Google do to push the field, and um, of course uh, we were thrilled by, by uh, this proposition, and so we um, worked with um, quite a large uh, team on getting as many different models as possible. Uh, into uh, this study using this QM9 data set and um, uh, uh, this was, I still uh, think it's up to now, this paper is the paper with the most, uh, with the largest number of different models in, in one uh, paper. It's, it's not a comprehensive assessment so we, we, don't, we cannot really claim that everything is in here but there are m really many many different flavors and of course uh, plotting things on log log scales allows us to compare them on a fair basis. And so what you see here in color is basically different representations and here in symbol shape you see different regressors. In particular we have kind of rich regressions, random forest and these two are neural nets and I always forget for what they stand for but he's in the room so you, you have to bother him. Um, what was really intriguing is that for the different properties we have, um, we see di very different relative uh, performance. So in particular for extensive properties such as uh, the, the energy or the polarizability um, or the zero point vibrational energy, um, we typically observe kernel ridge regression models to perform best and then for some intensive properties, for instance dipole moments or electronic eigenvalues, um, we actually see uh, the neural nets to outperform everybody else. And then uh, for one property, uh, the vibrational frequency, uh, the highest vibrational frequency in the system actually is best learned by a random forest model. Right? Now among the representations, um, we included uh, the previous ones. There's a representation we never had looked at before, um, which Patrick had some experience with the ECFP4. is a graph-based uh, representation, very common in, in drug design and so on. It was uh, very um, funny to see that for most properties, this one is so bad it's off the chart. Um, then you have a bunch of new representations which we introduced in this paper and in particular um, there's a molecular graph which was used for the neural nets um, approach and um, there's also a new representation which um, I show uh, on the next slide. It's called um, HDAD and this stands for Histogram of Distances, Angles and Dihedras. HDAD. So um, what was the key message in this finding um, was that for each and every property there was at least one machine learning model that would reach DFT accuracy. Right? And DFT accuracy is shown in these graphs as a dashed line. Um, for some uh, properties such as eigenvalues, DFT is pretty bad, so it's not on it. Um, and for many properties you would even reach chemical accuracy and that's shown by the solid black line. So the, the key uh, conclusion of this paper was that uh, machine learning models are ready to go beyond DFT as you go through chemical space. Um, and this is uh, illustrated here again, so we, we managed uh, for all properties to uh, go beyond DFT. Now this is the age dead. also all of those have been improved in subsequent work in one way or another. So this was a couple years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a, a picture of the age dead. Um, these are uh, where the histograms you will find in the data for distances, angles, and dihedrals. And so this is a, a brute force representation, and it outperformed uh, Bummel, Coulomb matrix, uh, Bob, and so on. Um, and this was really intriguing, right? So the distribution of um, your degrees of freedom, your relative de degrees of freedom, um, seems really to, to be very beneficial for your uh, machine learning model. And so on this comparative uh, history of, of representation, this is where HDAD um, lies. Um, 
Based on all these insights, we then went ahead um, with Felix Faber, who, who just graduated uh, with his PhD in my group, and um, he um, uh, proposed a systematic expansion in interatomic many body terms uh, just using Gaussians. And the one body term is a Gaussian you see here, um, which uh, is placed in the period, PI, and the group of atom I. That's the one body term, it encodes the chemical uh, identity. The two body term is, is just a radial distribution function here with Gaussians. And the three body term is also radial, uh, is a radial angular distribution, um, uh, which you see here for all these atoms. Um, now, these terms contain not only the distribution, but also this function here, this two body function, for the three body, we also have uh, such a function, which is basically a power law, um, which is supposed to recover the, the um, kind of uh, London dispersion effect and axial rotella effect we uh, saw in, in previous work. So it's this combination of some sort of force field idea with a distribution idea, right? Um, now it's all Gaussian, so you can write down the similarities of atoms explicitly and analytically. Um, <clears throat> this representation, um, which we dubbed FCHL after the first letters of uh, the last names of the authors, um, uh, we developed in 2017, it was published last year, and it gives this learning curve, the black one, um, which as, as you compare to HDAT, um, this is basically going from a histogram distribution to a Gaussian smoother one with, with these power laws, you, you make this a pro, uh, improvement. Meanwhile, many other people um, also uh, furthered their models, and um, here is a model from Carnegie Mellon with David Yaron. Um, this is the deep tensor neural net from Klaus Müller Group. Um, this is a, a neural uh, net with, with message passing. Uh, which Patrick maybe was alluding to, which uh, his group um, subsequently published. Um, and also with a, a postdoc of mine, Bing Wang, we, we developed a very uh, simplistic representation just based on London Axorotella Muto uh, spectrum. So this is what SLATM stands for, uh, which performs also not, not too badly here in green and pink. Um, this is the picture how it was in 2018. So it's really interesting. Many different people contributed now. So Stefan Maillard from Ecole Normale Supérieure with a wavelet-based machine learning model has uh, this produced this number. The Schnett neural network is also on this in, in gray here. Um, you see the HIP neural net from Los Alamos uh, is shown here. This is uh, the most uh, refined and sophisticated variant of the ANI uh, network by uh, Isayev and Reutberg. Um, there's also FISNet um, somewhere. Um, I'm a bit confused. Uh, oh, I think it's this red one. And there was also from Skoltech. Oh no, it's, it's this purple one from Skoltech. There's an active learning neural net from Alex uh, Shapeyev. Many of uh, these uh, uh, scientists uh, along uh, IPAM uh, uh, lovers. So um, last year, and I don't think the picture has changed, um, we uh, wanted to stimulate the field and we, we uh, announced the IPAM QM9 challenge. Um, so any professor on this list, and if you are not yet on this list, you don't have to be a professor. If, if you're not yet on this list, um, you're welcome to, to join us. A uh, promise $100 uh, dollars to um, the person or the, the group of persons that uh, has a, a machine learning model that, that gets to chemical accuracy with 100 training instances. Uh, this is also uh, described on Twitter, and if you want more details, let me know. Uh, 
Now, um, FCHL also works for other systems, really. It, it's a system, it works also for solids. This for water clusters, you, you get a very good accuracy. This is the Open Quantum Materials Database from Chris Wolverton. Um, he um, has a, a, a Voronoi-based machine learning model, which produces this learning curve. FCHL looks like this. This is Schnett. Um, we also revisited these alpasolites I, I mentioned earlier. Um, we have this um, elemental identity, and so we can also infer the chemistry of new elements. And this is uh, shown here. This is, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of information in this figure. Let me walk you through this. What you see is three columns. Um, on the left hand, you have a triple bond. This is a double bond, and this is a single bond. And the atoms bonding are the atoms indicated on top of the box. And depending on color, it either bonds to carbon, silicon, or germanium. And then you saturate the whole thing with hydrogen. Um, so just as an example, um, the blue line up here would be FCH3. <coughs> the blue line up here would be NH2F. No, nonsense, sorry. Uh, this would be uh, a triple bond, so uh, uh, NCH, cyanide. Yeah. Anyhow, so the, what you see then are always two curves for each color. One is a machine learning prediction and one is a DFT test. And the machine learning model shown was trained on all other molecules which do not contain the elements of that box. Okay, so when I want to predict the triple bond in cyanide, I train on all elements but N and carbon, N and C. And you see, for most cases, it's hardly distinguishable. Um, we can compare um, the effect of this representation, the FCHL, by simply looking at the, the metric, um, the distance. And this is for water molecule, a figure. What you see here is uh, the three body term in the FCHL versus the angular distribution function and the radial distribution functions as you would find them, for instance, in uh, the Bela Pinello uh, networks. And you see that um, there, there is some lack of uh, some invariance as you change either the bonds in water or the angle in water. Right? So these are uh, these 2D plots. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see the, the corresponding result then in, in the predicted energy. So this is the error of your energy. Here you, you collect a little bit of an error down here. These are the errors if you just use RDF and here if you use only ADF and here if you use both. So this is basically the representation that enters your neural net and, and the Bela approach. Now we can also um, look at the kernel matrix with the Coulomb. Uh, representation, the first two PCAs, uh, they will uh, result in this figure. And you see it's quite messy. Um, it looks as if it's something high dimensional, which was projected on, onto two dimensions. With FCHL, this is uh, the picture that emerges, much more, um, uh, much smoother. And what's also really happening is that um, the, the kernel really structures, uh, it orders the molecules by stoichiometry um, and uh, by uh, relative saturation and size. And in this way, your, your energy um, uh, becomes very, very uh, close to monotonic. Um, so I told you a little bit how uh, we can put these uh, curves down. I have. Uh, uh, another set of slides uh, using an alternative approach to pull them down and I will go through these very quickly because we are over time. Um, 
The, this approach is based on this idea that uh, you can exploit differences between levels of theory and um, DFT is, is not perfect and so um, you might wonder what is the correction to DFT and here's an example how not perfect DFT is. Um, this is for a bunch of organic molecules, relatively small. We did actually quantum Monte Carlo calculations and there's an interesting uh, significant fraction of them where the error of DFT is quite catastrophic. Um, so this is 24 kK per mole. Uh, this is worse than a force field, if, if you wish. Um, so you can learn this difference. You can learn a correction. And that's what we dubbed the, the Delta machine learning approach. And we introduced this in 2015. And um, this worked quite well. We can connect, for instance, Hartree Fock to correlated methods and learn the difference between these. We can see how learning curves um, reduce an offset. Here you see in green the direct learning with machine learning. If I add some, some basis and I just learn a correction from PM7 to some higher method or from DFT, so PM7 is a semi-empirical method from DFT to the higher level, every time I improve my baseline, my, my learning curve comes down. It's very systematic and exactly as you would uh, hope for. Um, you can use this to explore chemical space. I will flip through this quickly. And um, because I want to tell you about this paper where we used the machines to correct the DFT methods for the lack of van der Waals interactions. And um, this is, uh, we recently posted this on the archive. Um, you see up here learning curves of the van der Waals interaction energies. If you um, learn it directly, you see here in blue the learning curve. And if you learn the correction, your error comes down dramatically. Right? Um, and this is, of course, hugely important for all sorts of interactions which um, are abundant in, in biology and, and elsewhere. And um, you see that the machine uh, correction here is shown in red. It uh, performs better than one of the best, most popular van der Waals corrections, the D3 correction by Grimme. And maybe more importantly, if you were to add more training data points, of course, the red one would improve further, right? while um, this parametric uh, correction here um, uh, is already optimal. Um, we can use the machine learning corrections and fit, for instance, C6 coefficients to it. And I, I just, this is shown in, in this figure here. I just um, focus on this figure. Um, if you can look here, this is the C6, which was obtained by fitting to the machine learn corrections, um, corrected uh, uh, predictions. And um, this is the C6, which you would obtain actually from fitting to, uh, to the test uh, numbers. And you see a very good uh, correlation. Um, now, I'm coming to the last paper. And this last paper came out just this year, um, where we actually said, um, what about including all these different levels? Right, so you're not correcting just one, but we have this entire hierarchy, right? We have a ladder of, of uh, approximations. How do we combine them all? And uh, this was work uh, done with Peter Zasper and Helmut, Helmut Habrich, two mathematicians in the University of Basel. And it's uh, akin to the model chemistry by John Popel, who combined different levels of theory, different basis set sizes, different correlation, electron correlation treatment. And so for um, the QM7 data set, we uh, obtained for different basis set sizes and different electron treatment, we obtained uh, training data. And um, you see now here on the third axis, the different training set sizes we, we considered, right? And the question now is, given all that data, how do you combine 
at best as, as a training data? How do you, um, uh, in particular, how do you combine it in the most cost-effective way? So you want the most expensive uh, data, of course, to be as small as possible. So we tried um, these uh, different levels, right? And this is shown again here. Uh, we have three different levels and we have three dimensions. We have uh, the electron correlation treatment, we have the basis set and we have the training set size. And the model is, is uh, extremely simple. It's a simply a recursive machine learning model where you go from one level to the next level. Um, and um, we tried different um, ratios of training set sizes among the different levels. In particular, for S1 or 2, you will find these ratios of, of training set sizes. Um, now, if you just look at the data, it's very interesting because you see electron correlation explicitly through chemical space. Um, you can simply plot out molecules with the most electron correlation. These are typically saturated molecules, and those with the least are small molecules um, with uh, rather few hydrogens. So um, we started out by saying, okay, let's fix one dimension to one training set, uh, to one basis set size, and let's see if we can recover what Delta machine learning does, um, but only with, with three levels rather than just two. And sure enough, you see here direct learning in black. This is if you just have two levels, and as you add the third level, you uh, still gain a lot. So, so having two baselines is already way better than one. Um, and now you can open the third dimension and again adding, going from, this is the, the direct learning, then you, you have the 2D models and then the 3D models still improve a lot. So also adding a third dimension helps a lot. Now, the best model is for this ratio S equals 2. You see here in dashed in red. And this is chemical accuracy again. Now, you might wonder why you're so fond of learning curves. Why didn't you go there? Why is there this pink arrow? The reason is we ran out of cheap molecules. We would have required 25,000 Hartree 4 calculations in the smallest basis. We only had 7,000 molecules in this data set. Right. But we are now revisiting this and um, it, it works perfectly well. All right, this is the summary. I told you a little bit of, about why we do this and how we come down here. Um, in the second workshop, I will tell you also about results we have for improving the slope on this. But uh, for today, there was no time. I thank you for your attention, and I apologize for the additional uh, time I needed. It's all because of the jet lag. Thank you.